Welcome to St. John's Worship. We are so glad you're here. We have a number of things happening this week. We continue to have our prayer meeting on Tuesday, our youth group gathering on Saturday, and our Ageless Angels will be, this will be our last week of our Ageless Angels on Zoom since school is starting. We will be transitioning to a different kind of program for our young and young at heart. So please join us this week. I think we even have a special speaker for our Ageless Angels. All of those programs will be on Zoom. We also have a T-Perk meeting, so any member of T-Perk, please remember that meeting is one o'clock on Monday on Zoom. And for those of you who feel like getting out and about, our community garden is growing and flourishing and peppers are we also have our tomatoes that are ready to be staked up more so if anyone has um, tomato cages or would like to come we have all the supplies we need to stake them but we could use some help um, and there are a few other things to do around the garden so if anybody would like to come and join me in working in the garden Wednesday at 8 o'clock you are very much welcome. We especially need a truck to help haul our mulch. So if anybody has a truck to volunteer, we would love to, uh, to work with you. With that, we have no other announcements that I'm aware of. Does anyone in the pews have an announcement? All right. Then let us begin our worship by centering our hearts and minds and join together in our choral introit found in your worship outline. It is called Glory to the Lamb. Celebrate. 
celebration and joy where we have seen healing, where we have seen love, where we have seen endurance, and where we have seen reason to celebrate and the many gifts that you give. May you continue to open our eyes to those blessings, and may we continue to praise your name as we see them and experience them. Gracious God, for all of our prayers, both glorious and heartbreaking, may we lift them to you as your Son teaches us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. I invite you now to turn in your worship outline to our hymn, You Servants of God, Your Sovereign Proclaim, and that's on page four of the outline. <laughs>
Revelations has many images that we see in Hollywood, that we see in church tradition and legend, and that we remember in different ways. But one of the images that we are singing about and reading about quite a bit today is that beautiful river and the river of life. There are many examples of rivers throughout the Bible, and oftentimes they are life-giving, sometimes they are a little threatening, and often water in general is that same symbol. It is that symbol of chaos, that symbol of potential death, but also that symbol of great life and renewal. So let us sing together in our hymn, Shall We Gather at the River? reading today comes to us from, of course, the book of Revelations, chapters 21, verse 22, and then into the chapter 22 to 5. The book of Revelations is the writing down of a dream that a man named John had. It's not entirely agreed upon who this John was, whether it was the writer of the Gospel of John, whether it was uh, one of the more renowned followers of Jesus, but what we do know is that he was a respected prophet and voice to the church. And as we read the book of Revelations, we realize he is a man who lived during the time of Nero in Rome. 
And so there are images in his dream that fully capture the events that are happening around him at that very moment as well. He writes, I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God is its light, and its lamp is the Lamb. The nations will walk by its light, and the king of the earth will bring their glory to it. Its gates will never be shut by day, and there will be no night there. People will bring into the glory and honor of the nations, but nothing unclean will enter it, nor any one who practices abomination or falsehood, or but only those who are written in the land of life. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, through the middle of the seat through the middle of the street of the city. On either side of the river is the tree of life, with its twelve kinds of fruit producing its fruit each month, and the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. Nothing accursed will be found there anymore. But the throne of God and the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. And there will be no more night. They need no light of a lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless the reading and hearing of this scripture and use it in the building of our faith. Amen. Now we've all heard talk about the pearly gates of heaven, and this scripture gives us an idea of where that image comes from. That image of going to the pearly gates of heaven and having St. Peter look up your name in the book of life. We see comic strips that make uh, different little jokes about the entry into heaven. We see these TV shows that kind of spoof on the image. We read books like Dante's Inferno and Dante's... <laughs> What's the rest of that book called? <laughs> we all know about Dante's Inferno, but then he goes into heaven. Thank you, the Divine Comedy. But when we read the Divine Comedy, we see these images brought up as well. In fact, the, the Dante's Inferno and Divine Comedy pull from the Book of Revelations quite a bit in order to describe, in a very visceral way, heaven and hell. This is not a book written by Christ as he came back from hell and he ascended into heaven. It was not even... Christ himself saying that this is what heaven and hell looks like. This is a human's dream of heaven and hell. And so today as we read it, we see that many people try to interpret it in all kinds of ways. And as COVID hit, there were many memes that went around the world talking about, well, this is it. As uh, there were conversations about the murder hornet moving into the Midwest, well, there's the pestilence. Anytime things get disturbed or disrupted in the norm of our lives, we tend to turn to the book of Revelations and say, this is a sign that the end is near. And yet, for our writer John, living in a city that literally is burning, the man knows that pestilence and famine and war 
And disease are just a part of every aspect of life since the beginning of history. We have had death. We have had violence. We have had sickness. And we have had plenty of times when there was just not enough. Humans have struggled throughout history, and there are times when certain areas find great wealth and great comfort, and Rome certainly had its day. It was the most powerful nation in the known world. It had aqueducts that brought water to everyone. It had free entertainment that handed out bread. You just didn't want to be on the other side, the inner part of that entertainment. Rome was a magnificent city, but it could only last so long. And as all cities have seen, there are times of great wealth and flourishing, and there are times that they crumble. And John lives in the midst of that moment in history. So it is no surprise that he has a dream that brings to life the desperation and the horror of the moment, but also the fear of what's to come. But in his faith, we read the beauty and the renewal that he knows will always happen as long as God's involved. As a man of faith, he doesn't even know that he's going to be part of seeing this new heaven and new earth necessarily. He sees it in his dream. He knows it's coming soon, but will he be alive when it happens? That's not assured. He is just a carrier of the message. And yet we've all seen how heaven and earth have collided in our lifetimes and have collided throughout history. We have seen how the beauty of God shows through in even some of the most heart-wrenching moments. We have seen how evil can work in the world to corrupt and to discourage. The book of Revelations isn't always or is never really a book about the future, but it is a book about the now. In every time and place, this has been a relevant book, not because it's supposed to warn you about the end of days, about nuclear disasters, or about sun flares, or about human ex extinction. It is a book that reminds us that the world continues to have painful things happen to it. It's a part of the cycle. As people who continue to try to relate to another, there will be war that happens. As we continue to try to engage with each other and share with each other, there will be pestilence, there will be sickness, there will be famine. The world has its cycles. The world has evil that plays with it, and the world has good that plays in it as well. The book of Revelations is a book that says, where do you want to be? Knowing that you are in this moment of history. Do you want to be someone who's so caught up in the burning of a city that you don't see there are places to go where there can be a new heaven and a new earth built? Are you so caught up in the destruction that you don't see the potential for new building? This is a dream that is about devastating mourning. 
but also incredible, beautiful hopefulness. We often get lost in dreams. I think we tend to have these beautiful ideas as children. We have these Things told to us like, you can be anything, just work hard enough, and, you know, my brother wanted to be a horse when he was little, and that just was never going to happen. But he definitely horsed around. We get caught up in dreams that sometimes are ridiculous. We get caught up in dreams where we talk about peace on earth. We get caught up in dreams where we talk about every human having fed. And these, these dreams, quite frankly, are ridiculous. There are billions of people on this earth, and how we accomplish these wonderful dreams, I don't know. That doesn't mean we quit dreaming. Sometimes it is exactly these dreamers who talk about ridiculous stories that confuse the world that are the ones that are called to change it. The book of Revelations, for better or for worse, has been a book that has been steeping in Christianity and within our Western culture for a millennia and more. It has changed the way we think, whether we realize it or not. It has put the images of angels in our heads and in our Hallmark cards. And it is a story that perhaps doesn't always have a lot of understanding, or sometimes it is a story that is corrupted to use to bring about fear. But each dream is a dream meant for the dreamer. It is meant to give hope. It is meant to give strength, and it is meant to give a way ahead. For John, the book of Revelations wasn't a book that was meant to scare the daylights out of everyone who read it. It was meant to be, yes, a warning, but also a book to encourage hope. Encourage the beauty that is possible when all the faithful join together in a common goal. The beauty that is possible when you give up trying to control the world and give in to God who has already controlled it. The beauty that is possible in faithfulness. John himself doesn't really spend a lot of time trying to interpret the dream. Partly because the people in which were receiving the letter about the dream were living in a similar situation and were able to know what these symbols meant. You don't typically write bad things about Emperor Nero when he could easily find the letter. And sometimes when a community has to hear something very difficult, it is easier to introduce it first in the form of a story and a dream. I have a dream that one day my children will be judged by the content of their character instead of the color of their skin. There are some dreams that are easier for people to hear and easier for people to pursue when there is someone strong enough and brave enough to dream something ridiculous and share it with others. 
Let us be the carriers of a new heaven and a new earth on this earth. Let us be the examples of Christ the Lamb walking through the world, who doesn't lead war, but comes in peace. It might be a ridiculous dream, but we are the dream. Let us be blessed in it. The Lord be with you. One of the many ways we dream is by recognizing how sometimes even the smallest gift that we might be able to offer can be the potential for something great. Whether it's a few minutes to sit down and write a card to someone who might be lonely, to make a phone call, or to put a few coins into our boxes of blessing, we honor the many ways people give, whether it's big or small. These are symbols of hope that we celebrate. Today in St. John's, we thank all those who have been giving to our general fund, and we also encourage people to give to our second mile, which during this month is called PEW, which stands for Chicago United and Eden Seminaries. All three seminaries help sponsor and give great gifts to students so that those who are in low-income situations can still find the education in order to be ordained pastors. These gifts, though small, can grow to be blessings for many. We thank you for your generosity. Let us
May the Lord bless you and keep you. May God's face shine upon you and be gracious unto you now and forever.